to be here. Can everyone hear me if I talk about this loud? Yeah. If I taper off, just sort of wiggle your arms around. But I'll try <laughs> to keep this volume going. So I'm going to talk today about just sort of an overview of the research that I'm doing and what I'm interested in. Um, so I have some stuff that I did a while ago that I think you'll really find interesting and some things I'm working on now I don't actually have the answers for everything yet, but I've got some unpublished data that I wanted to show you I think will be pretty interesting. Um, I want to start out with a picture of Minami Sanriku, which is a very famous town in Japan. This is the town that's known as the town that's no longer there. I don't know the Japanese word for it, but it's a shorter word than the town that's no longer there. Because this is what Manami Sanriku looked like right after the tsunami. Pretty much everything was destroyed by the wave coming in and going out and the sheer destruction and erosive capability of the water flowing across the landscape. So when I see a picture like this, the scientific part of me starts thinking about the wave. But the human part of me starts thinking about, well, what if this is where I live? So if this was your town, what questions would you have for the tsunami scientists? What would you want to know? You would want to know if tsunamis could occur in the place that you live. And if they do, how often? Um, how large would a tsunami be? And where in my town could I go to be safe? So where is high ground, where is safe ground? And what will that tsunami do to my town, do to my landscape, how will it will affect the economy after the tsunami happens? There's all these questions that people who are not just interested in the, the sheer science of it, but things that scientists can answer and can help. So this is sort of, as much as I love just thinking about how the wave will flow around a building, I got to think about the building itself and people who own that building or live in that building. So these are the broad questions that ultimately I want my work to be able to answer. But without tsunami geology, how could I answer some of these questions? There is a written record of tsunamis. So if you don't study geology at all, you can say something about how often and how big tsunamis are based on written records in historical documents. So this is a figure that shows all of the known tsunami events that were written down in history and where those were in the world. So every black line is a known event. And you can see that in Japan and the Mediterranean, we actually have a pretty good idea of how often tsunamis happen and if we're good about how we read and translate the units of some archaic measurement system, we might be able to figure out how big the tsunami is. But in most of the world, there's a very short written record. So South America is relatively long. There's a couple of longer ones. But most of them, we're only looking at a couple hundred years, which is not long enough to really understand how often really big events happen. And you may notice that we're missing North America. So this is a map of North America in, seven, in the 1700s. There is no written history from where we live. Oh, I can use the pointer. The Pacific Northwest has no written history before the 1800s. And the last known event that happened here, which is a whole nother talk that someone could give would be January 26, 1700. And we know that thanks to Japanese records, but it took a lot of tsunami geology to figure out that that event even happened in the first place. So the reason we're able to study tsunamis from a geological point of view is that tsunamis are very erosive and they pick up a lot of sediment as they move across the land. So this is a picture of the Japanese tsunami flowing across farm fields in Japan. And you can see that the water is brown because it is full of sediment. So when the tsunami comes and goes, in that time that this wave is slowing down and stopping, it will deposit the sediment that it is carrying. And so it will leave behind a layer of sand on the surface of the soil. 
So this is a picture from the Indonesian tsunami in 2004. So if we go to known historical events where we know there was a tsunami, we can go and find those sand layers um, and start to understand what a tsunami, what the geologic record that's left by a tsunami looks like. So this is a picture of a tsunami deposit from an earthquake in Chile in 1960. This is a photo um, of an excavation. So someone dug a hole with a shovel and took a picture of the side. And it is a picture from 1988. So this is third, around 30 years after the event. There's a sand layer that was on top of a soil, and then later it got buried by some more mud. And then if we apply this to other places, we can start understanding more about tsunamis that happened before there were written records. So this is the, the beautiful case from the coast of Washington where there was a sand layer that's on top of a grassy field underneath some um, sediment that got deposited later. And this is the event from 300 years ago off of our coast. So this is what I was doing when I first started graduate school, was I was really getting into paleo tsunami research and understanding how often tsunamis happen in places where you don't have um, a population writing a record about it. So I was working in far eastern Russia. This is in the northwest Pacific. I was in the Kuril Islands. I'll show you a map of where that is in a minute. If you've never heard of them, I had never heard of them before I went there. Um, and we were trying to figure out how often paleo tsunamis hit this coast. And my work, just before I had figured out what I wanted to do for my PhD, was interrupted by a modern tsunami. So we were there in the summer of 2006, and in November of 2006 there was an actual tsunami that affected this region. So then I spent many summers after that studying the modern tsunami and learning how to relate it to the paleo tsunami. Um, and this is just a, a picture of what it did. So the tsunami was 17 meters high in this location. Um, the Photograph is almost in the same spot, but we have massive erosion of the back of the beach um, and large amounts of erosion throughout the bay. So the Kuril Islands are located there. They're just north of Japan. And so my PhD was from the Kuril Islands. I've also worked on Kamchatka, which is the big Russian peninsula that comes down that looks kind of like a fish. Um, I've worked in Japan and I've worked in the Galapagos. And since coming to Central, I now have a project in the Aleutian Islands looking at paleo tsunami deposits and in Puget Sound. So there's four topics that I want to talk about today and sort of in a logical progression of how my research sort of flows from one idea to another. So in order to be able to say things about what happened in the past when we have no observations, we need to first start with understanding modern events. Then we need to be able to relate the modern event to some geologic record that represents the past event. Then we need to be able to take that relationship to quantify the past event, the past tsunami, and then ultimately I want to take that past tsunami to understand the actual earthquake of which the tsunami is the only record that's left. So that's sort of the, the direction, the level of complexity that I go with through my research. So we'll start out with the simplest one. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, there are four different ways of making a tsunami. So tsunamis occur when the, some sort of impulse deforms the water in the ocean. I guess you could also do it in a lake. You could technically make a tsunami in a puddle or your bathtub. That's fine, too. But I like to do it on demonstrations. You can throw a puddle in a pond and make a tsunami. Um, so in an earthquake, there is some... Um, the, the rupture of the earthquake moves the sea floor, which ultimately, because water is incompressible, if you move the bottom of the ocean floor, you also move the top. So if you, an earthquake will push the entire column of water up, 
And then you have that surface of water that's been pushed up. Water wants to be flat, and so when the water comes back to being flat, it will send out waves in either direction as it returns to equilibrium, like a spring. There are other ways of making tsunamis. So this way would be if you have some sort of landslide that goes under into the ocean, it can push water from the side and cause a tsunami. You can have, what's this one? Volcanic eruption. Volcanic eruption, a pyroclastic flow can hit the surface of the water and deform it just uh, in a way that makes a tsunami. And then the last one, everyone know this one? Oh. <laughs> An asteroid impact will also make a tsunami. So these are the four ways, but an earthquake is 90% of the tsunamis are caused by earthquakes. So that's why that's our main focus of research is earthquake-generated tsunamis. And most of those earthquakes that make tsunamis are going to be subduction zone earthquakes. These are places where the oceanic crust is um, being subducted or going underneath the continental crust. Um, so the coast of Washington has a subduction zone there. Um, Japan has a subduction zone. The, the Ring of Fire is a subduction zone around the Pacific. And the reason you get tsunamis here is because as the, the ocean crust is going down, typically the overriding crusts are they're locked together. And so if this oceanic crust is going down and this interface is locked, you will bend that upper crust. An earthquake is that instant where the locking breaks and the two plates slide past each other, and this continental crust essentially springs back into position. And by doing so, it deforms the seafloor and causes a wave that will propagate in both directions. So that's the basic physics of how a tsunami is generated. So how do we measure modern tsunamis? What are we doing to figure out how big the tsunami was? So I have a couple of driving questions um, for the theme of my research into modern tsunamis. And the first is, the first are about the hazard related to the tsunami. So how large was it? And what characteristics of the tsunami can we measure that will actually tell us about the the hazard or the threat to humans or infrastructure. So the, the depth of the water, the flow speed of the water, many of these things you can't measure if you don't have like a measuring stick. And very rarely do we actually put some sort of instrument in the path of the tsunami and have it survive. <coughs> There's other aspects of my research that I'm not going to talk about today, but I'm very interested in how the coastline changes by a tsunami. And if there's changes that are going to be permanent, so that we might be able to recognize those in, in the landscape, or if there's changes that will recover with time. So this is the tsunami that gave me a PhD. Um, November 15, 2006. Um, it was the first trans-Pacific tsunami since 1964, so it had been a long time since a tsunami had gone all the way across the Pacific. Most people didn't hear about it, because um, it was typically not that big, although it did damage in Crescent City in California. It did $11 million of damage to the dock infrastructure there. Um, but in most places, it was less than a meter in the Pacific. And as I said before, we had been there in the summer of 2006, so three months before the event, looking for paleo tsunamis. And so we were able to go back nine months and then a year and nine months later to survey what the tsunami was like locally. So locally, it was not less than one meter. It was quite large. Um, but it left us with this amazing data set of actually being able to quantify what the landscape was like before, because we had been there making measurements, and what the landscape was like afterwards, and so how much had changed to the coast. So these red arrows are places where we had had before measurements, and then the black arrows are all new sites that we had gone to. So 
before, this is just one example of what the tsunami did. This was a stone bunker from World War II. That had, this is an uninhabited region, so no disturbance really um, of these bunkers. And afterwards, you can see all of these very large cobbles have been relocated, and the bunker itself has been broken into pieces. In general, we observed uh, because we had been there before, we had a very good handle on what exactly the tsunami did and what it didn't do to these natural landscapes. So this is a picture from after. <coughs> and you can see that there's distinct patches of erosion where the, the beach ridge next to the beach had been completely w washed out by the outflowing or the inflowing wave. Um, across the grassy surface, there was a deposit of sand that the tsunami had left everywhere, and there was scattered driftwood around the coast where normally that would just be on the beach at the back of the beach. And if you go inland from this picture and kept walking, you would eventually find something that looked like this, this lovely line of debris. Um, we're somewhat lucky that beaches of the world are covered in human trash. It makes it very useful to figure out how far the tsunami came because this line of trash, which we call a rack line, it's all floatable material, and the wave will push all the floatable material up as exactly as far as the water went, and then withdraw. And so you can find this very nice line that represents the furthest in the water came. And this is exactly like swash marks on a beach. So each of these swash marks represents one little wave. And in the tsunami, case of the tsunami, it's really one major wave, usually. Occasionally it can be more than that, but typically it's one major wave that comes in really far. And we know it's from the tsunami. We have marine material in it. Everything is floatable, and it's this lovely continuous line you can see here. The continuous rack line, that one had very large logs in it. So if you go out, find that rack line, and you measure its position relative to the ocean, then you get the two metrics that are used for comparing tsunamis around the world. The first one is called the inundation. That would be the distance inland that the water came, how far in. And the other word is the run-up, which is the elevation of the tsunami at its in maximum inundation point. So what's the elevation at the furthest distance inland the water came? So this is, these are the numbers that we use to quantify tsunamis. Um, so all of this data that I'm about ready to show you was collected by a huge team of people <coughs> over two years, two summers worth of field work. 192 measurements of the Carroll Island tsunami. Um, averaged about 10 meters and the range was two and a half to 22 meters high. 22 meters high is well over 60 feet which is really high. I measured that one. We were looking down on the ocean, way down there. It was crazy. All right, so that's sort of the, this is the easiest stuff that I do, is measuring how big a modern tsunami was. Relatively straightforward, you find the rack line and you have a pretty good idea how large the tsunami was. Great, how big of an area was that? Um, it, this is a couple hundred kilometers, a couple days by boat. What are those different bars? Is that, what's the x-axis? This axis, these are the islands here, and these are the islands there. Okay. I think it's uh, about 400, might be 500 kilometers. So if I can measure modern tsunamis, I want to ultimately be able to measure paleo tsunamis. So I need to be able to relate the sand deposit to what the water was doing. Because the water is what we care about if we're a person with a house on the beach. So in this field, what we're most interested in is the extent of the tsunami deposit. So can we use, in a modern case, can we use tsunami deposits 
as a good proxy for the actual water inundation and runoff? Does the deposit tell us how big the tsunami was? And then ultimately, will that deposit actually be preserved in an unaltered state so that we can go find the extent of a paleo tsunami deposit? And ultimately, can we use paleo tsunami deposits to tell us the paleo tsunami runoff and inundation? So that would be the goal of what we're trying to do. Um, so I can tell you about this one for the modern event for this 2006 tsunami. So we have the rack line, we have the inundation and the run up for the water, and the sand deposit is being laid along this coast for some unknown distance. So as part of my research in the Kirills, I, for every time that I measured the inundation and the run up, if there was sand deposit being left, so if there was a sandy beach, there was likely a sandy deposit. I also measured the inundation and the run-up and the thickness of the sand all along the coast. Or I measured, sorry, I measured where it was and where the sand stopped. And so here are some examples of topography where the blue is where the sand stopped and the black is where the water stopped. Um, four different cases, the ocean's on the left. Um, up to 400 meters inland. And from the Kirill Islands, from my observations, the deposit in the three month or the nine months, or a year and nine months after the event, was a very, very good match for how far the water came in. I was surprised at how good of a job it did. And then later, because I only had my cases from one geological setting of these volcanic islands in the middle of the ocean, um, I went through the literature review to come up with many other s settings that were very different than mine. And anyone who also measured the sand deposit, with only a few outlier cases, almost all of them were extremely good, and ultimately we had an average of 90%. Which I think means that the deposits are doing a good enough job that we can use the deposits at least as a minimum to estimate how big the tsunami was. So, um, at least for, I didn't want to go into this too much because it gets kind of boring and I show you lots of graphs, so I sort of just cut it out to that one slide. But the conclusions I have to date are that as long as you're looking at distances less than two kilometers inland, you can use paleo tsunami deposits to estimate the size of a paleo tsunami. As long as you're in a site that has enough sand, so if you have a sandy beach, you're pretty much okay. If you have a gravel beach, you shouldn't bother because the sand there won't be enough sand to make a long, thin deposit. Um, you have to assume that there's been quick burial of the sand. So if you're in a place that doesn't have very much vegetation, that sand is then going to be exposed to wind and other processes and it's going to get blown around and you're going to have results that don't, that where the, the preservation is not good enough to use that deposit. And you also have to be able to find the furthest inland deposit in order to say this is how far I think the water came in. If you can't find that, then you've really, really only found a minimum and the tsunami could be any unknown elevation higher or further inland. Does that make sense? <coughs> All right, so if I think I can use paleo tsunami deposits to tell me something about the paleo tsunami, the things I'm looking for are how big was the tsunami and how often do they occur? Um, and when, so when do we expect the next one to occur in the future? From a purely scientific point of view, we're also really interested in how the subduction zone behaves. I guess it's not purely scientific, there is some hazard aspect to this too. But we're interested in whether or not the frequency of earthquakes is varying over time. There are more earthquakes in the last thousand years and less beyond that, or vice versa. Um, and whether or not the, the subduction zone can be broken into segments 
um, or if there's some boundary that an earthquake is never going to rupture across. So an earthquake that starts to the south might hit a boundary and not cross that boundary. And these are all hypotheses that have been proposed based only on historical records. And we need to be able to go much longer than um, historical records to be able to make actual conclusions about this. But the, these sorts of ideas are already incorporated into hazard analysis without being actually vetted um, by longer records. So that's why we need tsunami deposits. So um, at this point, I can't say too much about the last one, but I'm going to talk a little bit about these other three. <coughs> so the idea with paleo tsunami deposits is that deposits are accumulating in time in the soil of a coastal landform. Um, so if you go out there and you dig a hole, you'll find some stratigraphy that might look like this, where um, you have sand layers separated by soil, and in the case of where most of the places that I work in, also with volcanic ash, that um, volcanic ash can be correlated with known eruptions, and it give, helps us get a timeline to our stratigraphy. So that's one hole. You go out and you dig lots of holes and measure the topography and you'll get something like this. This is an ideal case where you have, um, here's the land surface, so this is the ocean, and each of these was an excavation, and we found the deposit in these four, but we didn't find it in the rest of them. So then we have a minimum estimate of how far the tsunami came. The sediment suggests that it came somewhere in here, and then we can say, well, that was roughly 90%. But at least we know that it had to be, it absolutely had to be at least that big. Great, sorry, one more quick question on that. Yeah. Is, why do you excavate so far inland? Like after you don't find it a few times, why continue? We're usually not just caring about one tsunami. Okay. So we're trying to find the longest record and the farthest inland of all, as many tsunamis as we can. So we just keep going until you're not in the coastal plain anymore. But that's the basic idea. So I'm going to talk a little bit about something that I haven't published yet, but it's pretty exciting. So the Kirill Kamchatka subduction zone is a place that I and my colleagues have been working on for a really long time. So I started in 2005, actually, working in this part of the world, but my PhD advisor and some of my Russian colleagues have been working here since the late 90s um, to understand how often, how often tsunamis happen. The, the main goal of their research. How often do tsunamis happen? And this is just the map of the historical earthquakes that have made tsunamis. So written history started in the 1700s, sort of sketchy. Um, so we have a couple of events from the 1700s, nothing or almost nothing from the 1800s, and almost all of these are from the 1900s and this century. So 20 events that we know of that are larger than a magnitude 8. This is an extremely active subduction zone. Um, and these are all of the study sites of the research group that I've been working with, um, covering Kamchatka and going down to Japan. So this is the basic gist of measuring topography and digging excavations. So this is an example of data from one site. So this would be the ocean here, and the topography, and these are all the, the holes that we dug. We've, I'm pretty good at digging small graves now. <laughs> um, and so this is the stratigraphy from each of these holes. Most of this is sand or soil, and a blue bar represents a, a tsunami deposit, and the colored and the gray bar are volcanic ashes. And for some of those ashes, I know the age of it um, from work with my volcanology colleagues. So like this lowest ash was from around 1700 and the orange ash was from 1350. So then from this, I can conclude a number of things. So I can conclude at most in the last 300 years, I have five tsunami deposits. Or in the 350 years before that, there were three tsunami deposits. That would give me a recurrence of tsunamis of any size how often they happen. Or I can go back to my furthest excavation and say, well, way back here, 
I have one tsunami that's big enough to get back here in 300 years, and I had two tsunamis in the previous 350 years that got back that far. So that's sort of the, the numbers that we play around with. Yeah. How do you know the older ones are tsunami deposits? So... Maybe you can tell us that. No, I, I don't have any slides about that, but I'm happy to, to tell you. Um, so we work in settings where we're digging holes in places that the normal background deposition, um, we're essentially expecting just soil and soil accumulation. So tsunami deposit is a beautiful, clean sand layer with no soil in it, or very little, very, very little soil in it. So what are the processes that could deposit a couple centimeters of beautiful, clean sand back here? There aren't very many. So you could have a really, really catastrophic storm, and it might put some stuff in here. So if you look in these first two excavations, I didn't put any tsunami deposits there. I'm not saying there aren't tsunami deposits there. There's not enough soil for me to be able to find this layer that is different. So another thing you could do, or another thing that might leave a sand layer is like a major flood. There is no rivers in this space. There's not even street in this bit. So we don't work next to major rivers. We avoid rivers so that we don't have to deal with what if, what could it be that's not a tsunami. So we basically narrow our places that we work down to. The only thing that could leave a beautiful, clean sand layer is a tsunami. Maybe 300 years ago, there was a five-year-old Kamchatkan native who was just messing with <laughs> 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 right, the sand. But Other than that. The 500-year-old the Kamchatka native would probably have left some charcoal. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we've done this sort of thing at all of these locations. And usually we do many of these profiles and group it together into one location. So this, I don't actually know the total number, but it's a lot of Excel files. So a lot of data condensed down into these little stars. So, this is the answer. This is how often tsunamis happen at all these sites. Hopefully, this is just a bunch of meaningless numbers to you, because at first, this is a bunch of meaningless numbers to you. But there is some information that we can pull out of it. So this is the number of years between tsunamis. The first thing that really jumps out at me is that the, there are still tsunamis occurring north of the subduction zone. So supposedly that was not, wasn't happening before the research that uh, my colleagues did up here. Um, but there is no subduction zone, but there's clearly still very large earthquakes happening um, fairly often up there. But otherwise, these numbers themselves, just as raw numbers, really don't have much meaning until you apply lots of filters to them. Bree, how do you know that those tsunami deposits are related to earthquakes locally versus traveled some intermediate well, or Why are they distance? not like distal tsunamis? Yeah. Um, so part of that is uh, simply how big some of these tsunamis have to be. So I don't, I, so well, well, what about just the, you've got a subduction zone right there that's five degrees. Oh, yeah, seven. so we can model earthquakes from the subduction zone, and they don't make um, tsunamis oh, okay. that big up there. Yeah. And we do have uh, some historical earthquakes up here that are making big tsunamis. There was one in the late 60s, one in the early 70s. There was one that was really big. It was mostly in shallow water, so it didn't make a big tsunami, but right. that happened in a couple of years ago. So yeah, there are still... Isn't there some contention about exactly what the plate boundary is like up there? There is. Now, partly related to some of this data and right. partly related to some GPS work up there. Right. They think okay. that maybe there is actually um, this part of the ocean is still slamming into northern Kamchatka at a reasonably high rate. Okay. But I can talk a lot about that, but I should probably keep moving. Um, so... <coughs> I put some box around some numbers that are wildly different and yet really close together. 
So just by looking at these numbers, it would be hard to say what they mean because they're so different next to each other. So we have to filter out many different factors about the data. So we need to account for how big the tsunami was. We need to account for how the record's being preserved. We need to account for variations in time and how long the record is. So these are the things that we're actively doing right now in order to give you the final answer of what this data means. But I can tell you about some of it. Not the final answer, but the, the sub-answers that get us there. We're walking down that path. So if I think about the size of the tsunami, I can account for that by looking at my topography and seeing, well, how high was my deposit? <coughs> and so these are now color-coded how high that coastal um, platform is that these deposits are being left on. So if I look at these two sites next to each other, 140 says that the tsunamis had to be bigger than three meters. So every 140 years, I'm getting a tsunami that's at least three meters high in this one spot. But right next to it, I have a spot that the coast is higher than 10 meters. So there's 620 years between events that are larger than 10 meters. That's simply the elevation. I haven't done the inundation how far inland we are, that part you know. Yeah. But that makes sense, right? Doesn't explain everything, but it certainly explains some things. Another thing we need to account for, and this is one that is causing me to bash my head against the wall repeatedly, is the preservation of the record. So there are different kinds of material that we can dig in. There's what I would just call regular soil, and then there's peat. So peat is the deposit of a marshland, and the grasses fall very nicely like this and give beautiful layers. And if you have a tsunami deposit that's one sand grain thick, you can find it. Because you just sort of slowly peel it apart and you can see the sand there. So no, I'm not saying that I'm actually reporting on one grain thick tsunami deposits. We have some minimum estimate, because one grain thick you might be looking at just wind-blown dust or something. But in your peat records, this is a picture of peat, thin tsunami deposits are very easily preserved, whereas in soil, only the thick ones are being preserved. And which ones are they in that photograph? Um, uh, most of these are volcanic that you can see. Um, I know that there are tsunami deposits. They're, the sand on the beach is black, so they're going to appear sort of a grayish, blackish color. So I think this is probably a fairly thick tsunami deposit. This one looks like it simply because it looks a little rougher. Um, but the lighter grain ones and the red are volcanic ash. So that explains this difference here. Um, where at this site versus this site, we have a very big difference. Actually, <coughs> this site right here, where I have a tsunami deposit preserved every 75 years, which would be higher than any record that's been published for paleo tsunamis anywhere, is because I have lots of peat right at the shoreline. So any small tsunami, I'm preserving it, pretty much. Whereas Right next door, um, there's very little peat, so I'm seeing a uh, much coarser record. <coughs> so that's something we're still working on because we have 12 years of data and many different researchers trying to compare data, so it's a bit of a, a nightmare. But it's a very important um, problem to tease out. And then the last thing that we have to think about is whether or not the frequency of tsunamis are varying with time. So if you look up here at some of this data, the, there are more tsunamis occurring in the last 2,000 years than the previous 2,000 years before that. And at least according to my colleagues, this time period with fewer tsunami deposits correlates very well with the change in the tectonics 
where there's coastal subsidence rather than uplift, and so that may indicate that there actually are fewer earthquakes. Um, uh, in the time period when there are fewer tsunamis. At another site down here, we have a thousand year period with many more tsunamis preserved. And this is actually a period with more volcanic eruptions, um, which I'm not entirely sure what that means yet. We have a couple of hypotheses. Um, which is also true further down. We have a time period with more volcanic eruptions where there's more tsunami deposits. Fortunately, right next door, more tsunami deposits and the volcano is not more active. Um, and then as we get further down, we have a site where we have relatively consistent number of tsunamis that are very large versus a site right next door which records small tsunamis in addition to large tsunamis. And there we have a time period where there are more tsunamis. And unfortunately, these time periods of more tsunamis are, or maybe not unfortunately, all along this coast, the time period of more tsunamis is not the same time period. It's shifting in different regions. So that's still working on what that means, but it's very fascinating. So we have a lot of conclusions that we can say, even though we can't say everything we want to yet. But there are evidence for tsunamis that are bigger than the historical record all along this subduction zone. <coughs> Potentially, we see time periods of more tsunamis um, during periods of higher volcanic activity, maybe related to better preservation. Um, we're still working on that. And that we have earthquakes going on north of the active subduction. The frequency of tsunamis is not a consistent thing over time, but how these the frequency changes as you go north to south is still a work in progress because we're working on correlating between sites still. But that's how I'm using, I mean, that's how I'm quantifying these paleo tsunami deposits. It's a very complex can of worms, which when I started when I was a baby grad student, I had no idea that I would still be working on it more than 10 years later and <laughs> still don't have a full answer yet. <coughs> but the last thing that I wanted to talk about was using these actual paleo tsunami deposits to start understanding individual earthquake events themselves. So the things that I'm interested in here are trying to understand where slip on the earthquake was concentrated in past events, because where the earthquake is, has greater motion, um, greater slip, tends to be what produces a bigger tsunami, which means if you live adjacent to a part of the earthquake that has a bigger slip, you'll feel a bigger tsunami than someone a couple hundred kilometers down the coast would feel. Um, I'm also interested in whether multiple earthquakes are reoccurring in the same um, part of the subduction zone, and whether or not, or how often tsunamis are in the record that are not from earthquakes, that are from other processes. Um, and in terms of how earthquakes behave, if we can model past events, um, we can start looking at if places that have high slips are going to be permanent features over multiple cycles, which really helps with hazard planning um, and preparing for whether or not your town is going to get hit by a larger tsunami in the next tsunami also, like Minami San Riku, um, and whether or not there's boundaries that earthquakes don't rupture. So I'll talk a little bit about this first question about if earthquake slip was concentrated. We'll look at Kamchatka, where there was a very large event in 1952, um, magnitude 9. So as Dan mentioned, this was my master's thesis, um, which didn't go so well when I was a master's student, but I fixed it later and now it's great. <laughs> <laughs> they say you don't have to succeed in your master's to get a master's, and that was <laughs> it didn't work, but it works now. So this is the case where, again, we're figuring out what the minimum height of the tsunami could have been, and then making models of the tsunami to see if we can at least obtain that minimum height. So if we have the sediment limit, we have a, a range of what we expect the tsunami 
height to be, a minimum and a maximum range, although with a fair amount of wiggle room. But unfortunately for me, for the work with the 1952 tsunami deposit that I was looking at, I was looking at 10 years worth of field data, of which the data was not designed to collect for 1952, so I had the case where the tsunami extended past the profiles. So there I really only had a minimum estimate. The tsunami could have been infinitely larger and I would have no means of controlling for how high the tsunami was. So I have these two different types of deposit data that sort of estimate the size of the wave. So here's Kamchatka now turned a little bit on its side and this is the different kinds of, or the results of how big the tsunami was. So the triangles are those two different sediment data either um, the blue one, I have the limit of how far the sediment went in, and the green ones, I don't. And so that means it has a bar that goes up all the way to infinity. And I have a couple of historical observations. There's two different kinds of observations. There's observations in a generic catalog, where I don't know exactly where it was or what they saw. I just know that in this bay, they saw a wave this big. Um, and then I have a few cases of a post-tsunami survey conducted by the Russian military in 1955. The interesting, fascinating thing about this earthquake event, it was so big, the tsunami was huge, and the Russians, it was in the midst of the Cold War, and the Russians thought it was some new American weapon <laughs> that had gone off in Kamchatka, because this was all military zone back then, civilians didn't live on Kamchatka at all, it was only the military. So we could have gone to war over an earthquake. <coughs> um, so the things to see from this graph are that in this zone, the wave is around 10 meters high, and the, it's not variable at all. It's quite consistent. Um, further to the south, we have a, a fair amount of data that gets up to 15 or 20 meters high. And we have this zone here that's associated with some fairly complex bays here where it's quite variable. <coughs> So for this project, I worked with the DOA Center for Tsunami Research in Sandpoint over in Seattle. And we divided the subduction zone into little tiny segments like this. These segments are going down underneath Kamchatka along the, the surface of the um, subduction zone between the two plates. And for each of these little faults, I could move them a certain amount. I could set the slip on each of these little zones. And I did that many, many times, and I'm just going to show you one picture of results because results of tsunami modeling are very messy. But this is a, an image where each of these represents a different model, and here I just took a simple large patch of slip and moved it down the coast to see what happened to the tsunami on shore. And if you see a yellow line, it means the tsunami was too big. If you see a blue line, it means the tsunami was too small. If you see a red line, then as far as I could tell, with the data that I had for that site, it was okay. But if you remember, I have a lot of sediment data where it, it's going to be okay as long as it got to the height of the tsunami deposits that I saw. So, like I said, it's kind of messy, but the pattern that I see from this is I have a wave that's too big that up here in the north that correlates with this patch of high slip, and then as you move down the coast, um, the patch of high slip moves down and the wave bulge moves down the coast. So that's just sort of a very simplistic model and I modeled many different earthquakes. Here's some examples of some of the different earthquake slips that I modeled. And the ones where the land is shaded black are the ones that were giving me the best results in this case. And so, and I saw differences up to 20 meters based on these different simulations that I ran. And if you combine all of the different simulations that I ran, um, we can come up with a generalized picture of what the earthquake was like from this tsunami. So compared to uniform slips, so compared to everything being the same everywhere, the tsunami deposits and those few historical observations that I have tell me that there has to be something slightly concentrated up here in the north but not very, very, but doesn't have to be very much. Um, in the south, adjacent to this area where the tsunami was bigger, I have to have more slip, and in particular, I need to have a zone of higher slip um, near the trench. <coughs>
So when I compare this to, there's one solution of what the earthquake was like from different source of data, um, from Johnson and Sataki in 1999. So if you compare their solution, it agrees fairly well. But they also have larger slip in the south, not shallow, but um, I've been the, the methodology that they use sort of limits how shallow they can actually move their slip. Um, and they also have a concentration up here in the north. So generally good agreement. So this is very, very exciting that I've used a tsunami deposit to learn about the earthquake. So even though this I call this a pseudo paleo tsunami deposit because we know the event happened, so I had some idea of what the rupture area was like. I really knew very little about this event because it was, well, Russian. So the actually the, the post-tsunami survey that I included was declassified in the middle of my study. So I almost didn't have that data at all. Um, but also there are very few seismometers, especially close to this site. So very relatively little is known. This is also an earthquake that was pre-plate tectonic. So, um, <laughs> Plate tectonics wasn't ongoing in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> the interpretations of this earthquake were not made in the context of plate tectonics. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> All right, so that's the basics of uh, an overview of what I'm interested in and what I do my research in. So I go from everything from a modern event and how big modern events are to how we relate modern events to past events and then to paleo events, trying to figure out how we can learn about tsunamis from past events, how often, how big, um, and any characteristics of the actual wave itself, and then ultimately to go to that original earthquake that produced the tsunami and what we can say about that. Um, so I don't do this work by myself, I have a lot of collaborators all over the world. Um, these are some of the people that I work with for tsunami deposits and for the tsunami modeling that I do. So I'm happy to take questions. I love that.